as much as we're here to give answers, we're here to commiserate because that's what our industry is. It's struggling to make these decisions, struggling to, to share this value, struggling to understand the challenges. Yeah. And also, it's very hard to get rolling to get a beer, just so we're clear. <laughs> That's true. That's true. It's co uh, over coffee and motorcycles. That's what we're going to talk about. Coffee and motorcycles. Welcome to the What's Your Baseline podcast. In this show, we talk about our experiences and lessons learned in enterprise architecture and business process management. What's Your Baseline is designed to be for everyone. Newbies who are just getting started with these topics, organizations who want to improve their EA and BPM groups and the value they get from it, as well as practitioners who want to get a different perspective and care about the discipline. Each episode will tackle different key topics, providing context, background, best practices, and stories from the road, inviting you to learn from our challenges and successes, and demonstrating key tools to help you set up your practice and get the most out of it. I'm your host, Roland Wold, and I'm joined today by my co-host, J.M. Erlinson. Hey, J.M., how are you doing today? I'm doing great. You know, today, Roland, uh, for all of our dear listeners, if you can backtrace it to when we recorded it, is my birthday. So I'm excited to be recording today with you and celebrating some of the things we really love as I grow older in time. Well, congratulations, you know. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> uh, on the other side, I brought a guest to the party. Uh, I don't know if you've noticed it. So <laughs> we have uh, one of my old friends, Carlisle, Carlisle Gunn, in our show today. And uh, Carlisle is... Uh, Actually, little trivia, he has a master's degree in enterprise architecture, which uh, when I started working with him, didn't know that that even exists. So welcome, Carlisle. Welcome to the show. Hooray! Thanks, Roland. Glad to be here. Glad to talk about a degree that borderline useless nowadays, but it's fun. <laughs> <laughs> borderline useless. When I went to university, um, we didn't have degrees in enterprise architecture. I remember the closest thing that I was able to get in engineering was focused on like process engineering, process improvement engineering. We called it industrial engineering. No enterprise architecture. Tell me about uh, that, that degree. How, how did you find a, an institution that would offer that and what did it have? So there were two universities offering it um, when I was looking into it. So the, the first one was Kent State, I'm pretty sure. And the second one was Penn State, which is where I ended up going just because of more name recognition. Um, so. Penn State had just started the offering. <clears throat> it was very new, and it was it was uh, definitely an interesting journey, so to say. My my thesis was on outsourcing, offshoring, and backsourcing. Hmm. Um, but essentially, it wasn't a published thesis or anything. It was just you know interviewing some coworkers about what they thought. That sounds interesting, Carlisle. Uh, but before we get into the the meat of the conversation. Uh, Talk a little bit about yourself. So, so who are you besides the fact that we know you have a master's in enterprise architecture? So I am Carlisle Gunn, originally out of Alexander City, Alabama, which is a very small mill town that is now um, more of a lake town, I'll mm. say. So that was the, the birthplace of Russell Athletic, if people are familiar. It was a very old textile company. Um, All right. And, and you, you got out of there right quick and uh, <laughs> made your fortunes, I believe, now in Colorado. Right. Yeah. So after I graduated from the University of Alabama, my major was management information systems. I only looked for jobs in Colorado because this is where I wanted to be for the rest of my life. I had already decided when I was 12. Um, very hard decision maker right there. Um, <laughs> but moving away from a very hot, humid place to I'd been around the mountains and I was like, the mountains are for me. Yeah. So I, I got a job with Verizon uh, Enterprise, not the, the fun wireless side. They were getting all the money and being cool. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but got a job there as a college hire enterprise architect. Oh. So my very first job was being an enterprise architect and I uh, I leapt in and kind of I learned as much as I could as fast as I could um, started making progress there but in truth I, I learned in the end that we were mostly solutions architects and then on the side we were enterprise architects because your day-to-day -day, you're not just trying to rework your entire organization your day-to-day -day is just trying to help people get from A to B right, right? and so then Got the uh, the master's while I was with Verizon, and then Roland hired me to KPMG as an enterprise architecture consultant, and we did that for how long was it, Roland? 
I don't know, what? two years, three years. It was all downhill from there for you. So oh, I didn't. <laughs> I didn't even make it two years there um, before I decided to jump. Uh, some a, a little, some fun po politics behind that one, but yeah, uh, I think that I only worked just a couple enterprise architecture projects. Well, I was there, and the rest was just general management consulting. And then now you're at Trace Three. Yes. So Trace Three is a very interesting company because they're traditionally a value-added reseller, meaning that they're just out there slinging hardware and software, and then they're like, "Hey." we need to figure out how to offer services um, because we need to connect all this. And there's a lot of value proposition in connecting our software to our hardware, to the services, to an overall strategy kind of thing. So they started having that bigger vision and they built up this management consulting practice, which I have been a part of, um, but I'm now transitioning away to be a principal consultant for our financial services group. Yeah. So, well, Carla, that, that sounds interesting, um, but maybe we go back a little bit in the past. So how did you discover the, the EA discipline and what was interesting for you to do this type of work? And, and of course, you mentioned you did your master's degree in that, but what kind of training was required to get started with this? The great part about being a college hire enterprise architect is that it was just my, my, uh, my undergrad program was they had what they called a capstone. So we actually worked for companies for free. Well, they gave us scholarships, mm -hmm. air quotes. Of course, you can't see that. But uh, <laughs> they gave us scholarships and a company would pay 10 grand to have five undergrads and one master's student work on a project. So I, I pretty much got the job by just talking about how um, IT supports business hmm. was my major talking point and just like hammering in the fact that IT is just a supporting factor for the business to make money. And it's like your IT should never be detrimental to you. And so that resonated with my boss who he was an awesome person. Um, I need to reach out to him actually. So it seems like a lot of this was kind of on the job and coming from a, the perspective of an engineering mindset combined with circumstances at a client um, that would allow you to explore that and use that type of analytical and structure-based thinking, right? Right, yeah. So, I mean, they, they leveraged me pretty nicely <laughs> into what they needed. And that was kind of that A to B day-to-day existence for a while and mm -hmm. then while training me on the how should we think about things from this more organizational standpoint instead of just thinking about that day to day that's cool then then my ask for you next is tell me about some of your experiences specifically you don't have to name names or clients or things like that but your favorite or most infamous client experience and uh and project experiences that you've had so far in your discipline uh so i think that my my favorite experience was being stuck with Roland in the middle of Pennsylvania and working for a client there where we actually didn't have a stakeholder. We were making enterprise architecture what? in a vacuum. Mm -hmm. um, so there was, there was just one guy who knew nothing, who was approving all of our deliverables with, with Roland would sit him down and just hold out the deliverable and explain to him what it was and then walk through it with him. And he'd be like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and I just remember watching this man just nod and nod and just watching Roland speak and be like, he has no idea what's happening right now. That, that is true. But he was the lead architect for that organization, which is, yeah. is kind of sad. So, so they absolutely needed you. Otherwise, <laughs> the lights are on, but nobody is home. Well, the interesting thing is they, they also, we ran out, you know, out of budget. The project ended for us as planned. And um, okay. the, the reasoning behind that was, yeah, we're going to hire that person and, and you, whatever, train him or do some introductions on the job, you know, and then he takes over and he builds that EA team. And, and then we rolled off and literally the Tuesday after we rolled off, they fired him, which is a little <laughs> bit sad. <laughs> oh, no. All the work you've done. And I mean, I feel like that's one of the things we talk about in the podcast a lot is sustainment. You can't just leave it with an individual. You have to leave collateral. You have to leave organizational knowledge. You have to leave a practice 
that can be picked up and when you've got the no stakeholder or the or the single threaded conversation happening boy you are putting a lot a lot of hopes on that one horse you put all that money there <laughs> what if they don't come in first which we did yeah. jam so we, we left deliverables behind you know that was not the point but before we get into this uh, Carla tell us a little bit about you as a person you know so that our listeners know a little bit more about you you know what are your hobbies and interests in bucket list items um, and and some personal things let's see so I would say that my primary hobbies nowadays are skiing and I also snowboard uh, I don't know which one's my primary anymore but then also camping hiking uh, I used to play paintball semi-pro and then I also used to game semi-professionally and, wow! And then I played rugby and was not semi-professional with that. I was very bad, um, <laughs> but it was it was a fun time, you know. So uh, nowadays I'm a little bit too broken off to play rugby anymore. So I, I stick to the skiing, snowboarding, hiking, camping. If you don't mind me asking, what what position did you play in rugby? What number were you? Uh, I was seven. Seven. So was okay. Lock. I see. I see. I I, I was a three. Because okay. uh, that's my size. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm not big enough to be a prop and not small enough to be a hooker. So here, here we are. Oh uh, well, listen. Someday we'll we'll organize a little pickup rugby, you and I, when we all go to Colorado and retire there. <laughs> yeah, it might have to be a game of touch at this point in my life. I'll be honest with you. Oh, that's all right. That's all right. Well, this is some fantastic information. You you're, you're sound like a really interesting person. We're really excited to be chatting with you today, and in particular chatting about uh, EA strategy and capabilities. So Roland, why don't you take us into the first part of our, our interview and the conversation we'd love to have uh, about the why. Yeah, happy to do so. So uh, Carl, I, as, as you and I discussed before, um, obviously the question is, should an organization develop an EA strategy? Right, and I'm not only talking about a document, and, and as you mentioned before, we've done that before, but uh, what would be a good example of an EA strategy that you have? So with the EA strategy, I, th I think that I've seen quite a few approaches to how people want to uh, entertain the idea. But I, I think that what I go down to at the end of the day is, is your EA strategy should be very homegrown in my opinion, you can take bits here and there and put it together. But the benefits, you know, of bringing it all together is you have a direction, you have that North Star has been a fun term recently used by organizations, but something to drive towards, something to lead everyone else towards, and really trying to drive the true value of enterprise architecture, which I think is a hard struggle a lot of times, is to prove that dollar figure around enterprise architecture. Mm -hmm. So so if you don't go that homegrown route, uh, what do you see organizations do? Because I haven't seen a shop on Etsy that sells EA strategy documents. <laughs> <laughs> Not yet, Roland, but listen, what's your baseline is only in our first season. <laughs> oh, <dang. laughs> on you, know, you want to start canning enterprise architecture strategies? Let's let's see about that. That's going to be a very interesting. I think Togaf already tried to do that. Um, they made it a very <laughs> wide can, though. Um, and so starting from scratch, I think, is something that's very rare nowadays. Me and you had, have seen a, a few of those, but it's way more common the fact that it does come out of nothing and people just saying that they need process. So when you don't have a homegrown architecture and you start to really define it on your own, I think that uh, there's a lot of different disciplines that you can start with. My personal favorite is growing from solutions architecture upwards. So if you're sitting there and you're creating these one-off solutions for individual problems, sooner or later you're going to start running into the same problems over and over again and start being able to reuse your existing solutions if you've captured them properly. And this is the start of your enterprise architecture um, group, process, collateral, whatever you want to call it. But it, I think that one thing that Roland's always hit on very heavily that I agree with him about is the need for a repository just to hold that information and be able to relate back to it consistently. Yeah, the interrelation of things relies upon the creation and dissemination of those things. Um, and you have to have some capacity to tie directly to them otherwise they'll become islands and in being islands they'll go somewhere to die 
Right. And I think that that's when we talk about having the centralized architecture group or just an enterprise architecture strategy in general. So when you start developing this, um, who do you involve in those conversations then? So what are who are your stakeholders? So with the stakeholders, a lot of times you end up being at, at a much lower level, right? So building from the ground up, you <clears throat> instead of starting with these executives, which is typically people think about top down. And I really love to make fun of enterprise architecture as commonly being an ivory tower. Mm -hmm. And so that's when you have that top down, everyone consume what I do, believe in me kind of mentality versus the solutions architecture approach that I like to pitch is more so directly on the ground with the DE engineers, directly on the ground with the people working the processes and what they need, and then trying to enable them from the bottom and move up from there. But how do you get that done if you don't have the mandate? I mean, one of the things we talk about a lot is is in change management, you need to have accountability. And oftentimes executive alignment and support is how you achieve that accountability. Without that, I mean, people can do whatever the heck they want. There's no consequences. Right. And I think that, you know, to your last point, sponsorship is always going to be one of the most important mm, things. Sponsorship. Um, okay. Yeah. So sponsorship is, it still has to be there. Right. But I, I think that it's necessity is the mother of invention. And that's when we start seeing enterprise architecture come from uh, a grassroots kind of place. So, Carla, when I look at the implementation of EA strategies, I, I see that phenomenon that uh, people equal EA Uh, to the ARB, you know, the committee of no that we have spoken about in this podcast ad nauseum. Uh, is that your observation as well? Oh, yeah, I love it. Because anytime you're like, do you have an architecture group? They're like, yeah, we got an ARB. <laughs> <laughs> so then you, oh, no. you talk to them about it. And it's like, it's either it's either head nodding, or someone making life really hard, which is where you get that office of no. If you were the master of the world, what would be your recommendations to resolve those situations then? Well, this is where I, the way of the world has changed so much in, in that now DevOps is this big thing, right? So it's, it's everything has to move faster. So if you're the gate, you're not providing value. So where I see it is the ARBs need to be fully ready to have things loaded and ready to go about here's how you can get to a point that we need you to be at. Here's what we can do to support you. Here's documentation that previously has been used kind of thing instead of just being like, hey, you got to stop right now and figure this out. So you're saying that that you act almost as kind of like a guideline creator and then people can follow those guidelines as they move quickly. So it's rather than being your stop sign, you're kind of like a seatbelt. Right, right. Because uh, I, I think that I've been on too many calls where people are like, well, you can't move forward until you figure this out. And they're just like, why did I ever come to you guys? Just so you can tell me no. It's like, you're not helping anything. <laughs> you're just making my life worse. So, I mean, where I try to put in architecture review boards nowadays or councils, whatever the term that people like to use, is that I make sure that they're fully prepared to be locked and loaded, ready to go and supporting the organization, providing the value and not being that gate in a DevOps pipeline. When today you're asking people to, you know, rip through and deploy, have multiple deployments in a day. You can't do that if you're sitting there just trying to walk everything through a board, trying to get onto their weekly meeting. Which is actually interesting because <clears throat> that has obviously an impact on your EA strategy. You know, how do you uh, set the goals for the EA organization? Mm -hmm. And that also means how do you incentivize people, right? If you don't have the committee of no and no. So dear listeners, let's take a quick break. And I have a couple of questions for you. So for example, where do you interact with your EA strategy, assuming you have one, and how does it influence your design activities that you do? Mm -hmm. What information do you provide or require uh, from your users? And how is that information communicated? Uh, where is that working? Does it break down? Uh, is it uh, leading to a better result? So we're going to leave you alone for a couple of seconds, play some nice music, and you can think about it. And remember, don't take notes while you're driving, and we're going to be back in a few. And be loved in return. All 
right, folks. Well, thank you so much for taking a couple of seconds to think about how you might be involved in EA strategy and design. But now with our guest and expert, Mr. Carlisle, let's get moving. Talk about the how. So Carlisle, tell me a little bit more about the components of an EA strategy. Where do you start and how do we build from there? Well, where we typically like to start, uh, we being me and Roland, when we did this previously was starting with the maturity assessment mm -hmm. first. Um, and I think this really depends on if you're starting greenfield or not. If you have nothing, of course, you don't really need the maturity assessment, but that you're still putting that line in the sand or that starting position, so to say. So you have to at least realize where you are before you can get going and what your true value is going to be. Or, And I think that that's step two is setting the goal right mm. so it, it's really what is that <clears throat> once again north star that you want to drive towards and picking directly in front of you this is what we need to get done this is where our value will be this is what we've been tasked to do a or b which is a very interesting question which i think is outside of this podcast episode like how do you measure success and what is a industry acknowledged value creation kpi model for ea uh because i think that doesn't exist oh yeah well, that's a good question to ask and hopefully something that that we can work on particularly to prove the value of the of the groups that we're working with and the and the efforts that we go to and by the way just as you were talking carlo i thought you know the first question you might ask is what's your baseline Ah, pitch for the podcast, pitch for the website. It's a great way to start the conversation. Clever. I see what you did here. <laughs> but yeah, in, in all seriousness, Carl, so, so say you did your maturity assessment, right? And obviously the results can vary. You can have a very formal uh, structure being set up and defined artifacts and repository in place and everything is nice and tidy up to a point where where there is nothing of that. There are no governance processes being defined. There's no repository. There are no standardized artifacts or whatever, right? So there's a full bandwidth there. Mm -hmm. um, you come to a conclusion to say, okay, we are maturity level, whatever, one or two. Um, how do you take this and then say, okay, I bring to paper a strategy that will allow us to grow from the current as is maturity level to a higher maturity level, um, maybe in a year or two or three from there. So what would you look at to get started? When you've got an organization and you're reading in at that one or two, right? And you're already acknowledging that we need to make this growth forward. It's then that you start to really set those strategic objectives that you need to meet. And then at the same time, those should be directly aligned to your stakeholder needs. Mm -hmm. um, and then from that, you define very clear objectives of this is what we need to support the business. Can, can you give an example what you've seen in the past for those three areas? So with an IT strategy, everything should roll downwards, right? So you should have your entire organization aligned upwards to those objectives and be supporting those. If you do not have an IT strategy, I would first suggest you get one of those. But <laughs> <laughs> but otherwise, you know, you can start thinking about what is the easy, low-hanging fruit that you can support and drive value towards. Um, I think that if you're really in that one or two area, what we'll see a lot of times is the fact that you're just, once again, having an ARB and that's about all you have. Maybe you've got the repository, maybe you don't, but that's the thing you should start driving towards is reusable standards that people can take and leverage and say thank you for. And just talking and spreading the good word of your architectural reusability and your process simplification or optimization. Yeah, that sounds like a really important part of the puzzle is communication. Because as much as what you're doing is strategic and it's structural and it provides capabilities to other groups, those die on the vine if no one knows about them and if no one believes in them. And so I could assume, and you know, correct me if I'm wrong here, that change management is part of this conversation, being able to evangelize, being able to earn buy-in and work collaboratively to serve needs. Am I, am I right here? Definitely, definitely. I mean, we can harken back to my and Roland's little engagement that we had fun on in uh, EA in a vacuum is 
the right term, right? <laughs> yeah, but if, if I think about that, I think JM, the, the auto environment, it's, it is important, period, right? But I think it's the how, right? So it comes in a second phase. I think that the um, EA strategy is defining the what, right? And, and I think the first step is to identifying your stakeholders, Right. That's the first thing, because people, like Carlisle said, people think EA equals the ARB. That's a little bit too short, right? But once you find their needs, once you figure out their objectives, and you can derive your EA objectives from that, I think that's a good start, because you also think about um, what do you have to put in place. So speaking of which, Carlisle, what would be the next step once you've figured out what the objectives are? So once you figure out the objectives, this goes back to kind of creating your capabilities and then, of course, being able to measure it. Yeah. Um, and, and so with that, uh, nowadays, as a consultant, everything has to be visible, right? If you walk out of an organization with nobody seeing what you've done, you've essentially done nothing. And Ooh. it's it's both sad and true, but that's, that's where we are. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Um, so the KPIs help you prove what you've accomplished, show your value to the organization, and keep you funded. So that sounds lofty. Can you give some tangible examples for that, how you would measure the KPIs or which KPIs to choose? The KPIs that I prefer to go after are typically around process. So it's process improvement of getting projects from A to B faster and faster. The issue with enterprise architecture is since it doesn't exist on its own in a vacuum any sort of standalone everything should be intertwined if you're not intertwined you're going to fail but people can take your value and put it towards themselves so if you start putting in all these great processes to enhance the devops pipeline to in general just speed up any sort of process in general it's like that organization that you worked with typically takes the value and puts it on their paper so Mm. you have to actually capture it beforehand to say, hey, we went after this. Hey, we were the like catalyst for this driver, etc. Because if you don't, it's their paper; they own it. Yeah, which brings me to to what we spoke about in one of the previous episodes. You know that the various roles of of architects. Mm-hmm. Um, you might recall that the two by two uh, of degree of involvement and and specification of what you do. And there were obviously two quadrants where you see the architects as part of the strategy group to define the what, and then enterprise architects as the transformation agent defining the how, how to get there. And I think the majority of EA groups just doesn't do that because they have that understanding that they're part of IT and they just have to deliver whatever it is, you know, cables, boxes. I once interviewed with a a company. And so I, I get in there and I start talking about my enterprise architecture experience. And he's like, well, what do you do about APIs? He's like, majority of what we do is make sure that people are fi- following our API standards. I was like, as an enterprise architect, that's your primary job is to review <laughs> APIs and integrations. <laughs> and I was immediately just like, I need to leave this place. Yeah, right they're, they're not interviewing for the position you want <laughs> or should be there. Uh, and, and I think, Roland, you've actually uh, quietly been pitching uh, with the reference to our graphics, um, the website. Remember, folks, that a lot of the things we talk about in these uh, podcasts become graphics that you'll see on whatsyourbaseline.com uh, under the episodes. And so for today's, I know we're going to be publishing something talking about architecture strategy development with the different boxes we've been talking about today. So not, not only do you not have to take notes, but we're going to give you a handy guide after the fact that will let you take this knowledge and actually put it into practice with a little bit of guide rails to get you there. So the next question I have for you, and this is this is going to be an important one for, I know, I know some of my clients are actually asking about this right now, is when we take a look at capabilities and capability hierarchies and we connect them into processes and our business architecture and how do you make that connection? At what levels do you make that connection and how do you leverage that for reporting and analysis, which you've been talking about before? I would look for what capabilities does the EA group need to develop? Right. It's not the capabilities of the organization. You know, how am I able to write an invoice to a client? I think that's not what we need. I think what we need is what are capabilities that the organization needs to build to be able to run an EA group. I'm thinking about literally like the ideas of like a service architecture, like a capability hierarchy for the company. That comes next because in my mind, services are capabilities with an SLA attached. 
Yeah, but I mean, no one's going to create a hole for you. It's the same with any organization. You have you have to find your place, and there has to be that need that you're fulfilling. It's not a capability. It's you you're fixing something. I mean, they're not going to support you and create this pedestal for you. You have to solve a problem. That's why enterprise architecture is created. But if you take it a step back, you would see, oh, you build up certain capabilities. You know, that you then can transform into services to say, yep, I do have whatever, a dashboarding service. I do have an integration service. I do have an analysis service for you, right? Or you build up process mining capabilities because you, you want to have a data driven as is analysis of your processes. So these things. So I think in the in the strategy document, you should have a section talking about capabilities. What do we need to build? What should we be able to do? And then based on that, you prioritize and you derive your products, your services that you then hold the EA group accountable for. All right. So, Carlisle, tell me a little bit more about the idea of your organization's capabilities, your enterprise architecture organization. What do you need to build up to give yourself the ability to execute on it and the resiliency to get through challenges presented by the business? And I think that coming in at a ground level and defining those base capabilities, it, it should be very simplistic. Hmm. So you're going to say that we need X process, we need X repository, we need um, a council, so to say. We need to start making this visible. We need to put down on paper the things that we can help with. Right. Um, and I think that I should apologize to your listeners because everything I talk is at a high level, which is the same as same thing as what TOGAF does um, because until you're in an organization and truly staring at each individual process and their organizational needs, it's going to be high level because EA should be something that is customized to a certain client. So if I understand you correctly, Carla, you would have, for example, a situation where a system implementation is struggling because you have a bunch of techies trying to configure the tool without the context of an underlying process. You know, what, what will the user do? So if I take this and transfer this, you would need your EA group build up a capability to capture processes to provide that context so that in the next project, um, you have this as part of your development process. And you build up that capability of capturing and managing a process as part of your business blueprint. Is that right? Yes. And I think that if we dive in, roll in and start thinking about more in tune examples. So let's take an ERP. So a lot of times when organizations implement an ERP, they're just trying to get it stood up. Right. Mm -hmm. So you have these these SAP implementers come in and they do configure it to what you're asking for. But the thing is that most organizations don't know what to ask for because you do an ERP implementation once every 20 years, maybe, maybe 10 if you're trying to be cutting edge, but really you should just be keeping it up to date instead. So your drive in that ERP implementation should be the same with another implementation of a smaller tool. What mm -hmm. is the end goal? What do I need it to do? And how do we provide business value? So it's very simplistic in how you approach it, but your goals should be written out and clearly defined so that you can follow and you can call it truly done or successful at X or Y point. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. And then you can take a step back and, and abstract it. You know, what have I done in this project? What is the capability that I have? And then I think the next step is to package it, right? To say, okay, we, we take our capability that we've seen and then we package it as services to the organization. Um, Carla, how does that happen? What have you seen how organizations have done that? They typically don't. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a quick answer. <laughs> wow, that, 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 is a, that is quite the, uh, the E or EA. Um. <laughs> well, then let, uh, yeah. let, let me rephrase that. In a, in a wonderful world, now you've mapped out your capabilities. In my little example, you have the capability to... Um, capture processes as a means of getting the context of a system implementation. What would be a service derived from that? How could that look like? So let's just take the overall outcomes that you're trying to get. So with the ERP, we need to support timesheet capabilities. We need to support 
um, expense reports, and let's throw in manufacturing processes for funsies, right? Mm -hmm. So when we write this down as the next services and packaging them up, what we're looking for is that overall goal that can be reused, that agnostic goal, mm -hmm. so to say. So what is the true value of the manufacturing process being implemented? Well, we're looking at a 10% reduction in supply chain cost, or we're looking at a 5% increase in manufacturing time, et cetera. When we take these goals with the manufacturing process, with the overall supply chain, et cetera, how do we make those agnostic? Well, we start looking at them and reviewing the fact that we originally thought we would get 10%, but we only got 7% or we originally thought we were going to get 5% and we got 10%. So that helps you kind of go forward in the service of goal setting. So everything becomes iterative and inside of your enterprise architecture practice. And that's how we should view the world almost nowadays is everything should be incrementally improved. You should never call it something done unless you truly believe it's perfect, which I think that that becomes a very hard thing for some people. I think that Roland's ideal perfect scenario is uh has a lot higher quality than mine <laughs> <laughs> roland volt the master of quality yeah the question is is you're trying to build an ea strategy and you're trying to build documentation you're trying to build processes how do you know that those processes are ready for prime time because you're not looking for perfect you're looking for good enough your internal processes you exactly. know how you run your aa shop yeah, how, how do you know that those are ready to go? What stakeholders need to sign off on them? What sort of work do you need to have seen done? And what like w what markers can you look to if you're an architect that says, okay, I think I'm ready to show the community what my requirements are, what my practices that I'm pushing are, that, and they'll be able to consume them and use them effectively. I would do this agile. I wouldn't create, as we did in, in that project that Carla mentioned, I wouldn't create a Word document. I would put it on a wiki, you know, a Confluence, a Notion or whatever, and then say, okay, this is our first shot, and this is what we're going to do, and we're going to try it, and if it doesn't work, well, we're going to change it. Where do you find the, the challenge between iterative design, as in releasing information early before you've actually you know, had a chance to fully validate it, versus the authoritative design. So saying when we say something, it's coming from a place of knowledge, a place of experience, you should follow what we do. Where do you balance that? So this is where it gets difficult because enterprise architecture as a whole is you sticking your hand into other people's buckets yeah. and trying not to get bit. <laughs> bit, pinched, whatever, whatever's in the bucket, right? You want to stay away from having that issue come up. And when you get into engineering or application development moving their cheese right you've got a high chance of getting bit so that's where it starts to become more collaborative so it's when you both agree that it's ready to go forth or ready to be presented to a team and start being pushed you know iteratively improved mm -hmm. so thank you carlyle for the steps that we discussed in how to create an architecture strategy so just to summarize uh, what we've discussed the first thing would be to figure out who your stakeholders are mm. right and you try to evaluate what are their needs so who are they what are their needs and what are their objectives and that is obviously more than maybe just the it group and then you would derive the objectives for the ea group where do we want to improve what do we have to bring to the table how do we get better yeah and then based on that you would then go and look at ideally a capability reference model if you have that or you would do like Carla said the bottom-up approach of deriving uh, the capabilities from the experience that you do and you would package them as services mm -hmm. uh, the, the last thing would be then going back to the uh, objectives is obviously defining what the success is what are the KPIs that you measure uh, which is an iterative thing and my question to you Carla is um, what have you seen as KPIs? And do you agree with my assumption that the KPIs for EA are the most hardest thing in the whole strategy development process? I 100% agree with you on that. Um, in terms of KPIs that we've previously created, it once again goes, goes back to that 
process improvement more so than anything else because that's the easiest thing to prove. I mean, if you tell someone to build their application better and start giving them more fundamental architectures they should be following, it's hard for you to stand up in front of an executive and be like, I, I told him to use this better architecture. That's my doing, <laughs> right? Like you're going to be sitting out there looking like an idiot. So where we see the true KPIs that you can measure are those process improvements, process simplifications. So if you look at your business and really looking at their fundamental processes, or a lot of times ITSM processes is where I end up finding a lot of success. Simplifying those, making those uh, clicks go down, making the handle time go down, then that's where you can find the easy value. So that is that is all business architecture. Have you seen some KPIs in the more technical areas? You know, if you try to sell standardization or reduction of apps and, and all these things, or is that an IT pipe dream that nobody cares about? No, I think that what you see is just more so in the standards portion of it, hmm. uh, mm -hmm. which is this year we have defined the configurations that can be used by organization for Linux, Mac, Windows, et cetera, for your servers whatever you need. Interesting. And I wanted to talk about this because it comes up a lot. Um, how much are you talking KPIs when it comes to like measurable, specific, numerical value driven stuff versus how much can you talk about goal achievement or KPIs that don't necessarily have a number tied to them? I mean, you know, we can tell that we have improved our operations, the way our teams communicate, those sorts of things, but they're often difficult to measure. Where do you take that and actually quantify it or do you um, and how do you prove that there was value achieved well, it also depends what you view as um, kind of your value add or your your kpis that you've given i've seen organizations essentially say that hey we talked on 10 different calls that was a great metric for us oh, and, <laughs> that's so, not great yeah so in terms of kpis they, they are what you set them as but the ones that find value are typically saying we did x for standardization we did y for process um kind of things so Carla, that is that is interesting because i also see in the situation that people just shrug their shoulders and say meh you know i don't care about whatever we got x percent higher reusability of our applications or we reduced our apps by so and so most clients that i've seen they look at Oh yeah, what is the degree of budget that I can free up so that I don't spend 85 or 90% of my IT budget just to keep the lights on, uh, but have a higher percentage of uh, doing some uh, innovation in that field? Everything has to drive back to a dollar, right? And one thing that you brought up that I hadn't hit on yet was the fact that application rationalization is one of our biggest money makers in terms of enterprise architecture. Mm -hmm. It's something that is quantifiable very easily. You can show what each app is costing if you're tracking it correctly and then what turning down A, B, and C provides you in terms of budgetary free up, right? Yeah, but it can't all be application rationalization, right? Like that is an end of the execution of EA strategy, but it isn't the only goal. It can't be. Otherwise, you'd be spending all your time just paring down and paring down and paring down the company and missing a lot of the components that would allow you to build it back up. Simplification is the key word here, right? You try to get clarity in what the organization is supposed to do, and mm -hmm. you try to Uh, minimize the degree of complexity that you might have built in your technology versus uh, satisfying whatever egos of people who said, but I want to have this tool. <laughs> well, I think we're getting to a really good point where we can cap off some of the thoughts we've been having today. But I, I, I think this is an ongoing conversation. And Roland and, and Carlisle, I think we, the key here Uh, that we that I've learned in this podcast, and I think a, a lot of our listeners will have learned, um, is that we aren't settled um, as a as one standard, as one global approach. Carlisle, you started this off by saying this is going to be a high level discussion, but 
your circumstances are going to drive the actual execution. Your organization, the way in which you work, the things you need to have are going to help it hone in on what's going to provide the most value to you. And so for that, we're going to leave you, our listeners, with a question specifically about that. Tell me about your organizations and architecture strategies that you have seen implemented. Um, what components of what we've talked about um, have you found valuable and which ones are still struggling to be implemented um, or which ones uh, are not really giving you what you need? And most importantly, if you could flip a light switch tomorrow and have things changed, um, what would you and how can you today help enable the creation and execution of those pieces of our EA strategy and capabilities? We'll leave you for a second to think about that and come back with our conclusion and thoughts about the next show. Welcome back. So in the last 45 minutes or so, we spoke about the challenges and the task to create an EA strategy, right? What is an EA strategy? Should it be that big document that maybe nobody reads? Does it even make sense to write an EA strategy? But I think we agreed on that it's helpful to have something brought down that shows the objectives, that shows the KPIs that shows the capabilities and services that an EA group can bring to the table with all the complexity of how to uh, develop those either bottom up or you take some reference stuff or you look at a maturity assessment as a baseline. I also think we all agreed on uh, the KPIs being the biggest problem. How mm -hmm. do we measure success? And I think this is, Carlisle, this is where EA as a discipline is struggling with, even though it's 30, 40 years old. Oh, yeah. um, wouldn't you agree? Oh, definitely. I mean, I, I think that even when I sit down and try and write out what my KPIs should be for my current clients, it's still very difficult just because I am in that silo, so to say, a lot of times, whereas I'm, I'm brought in under one little area of the organization, whereas you need to be way up top to try and do the true enterprise architecture KPIs. Yeah, I think you need to have a seat at the table when the what will be defined, right? And say, oh, yeah, this is the benefits that we get on either of those use. And you mentioned the processes because it's easy to measure, um, but also on the more technical views of an architecture. It feels like a catch-22 um, where you want to get a seat at the table by showing that you have the value to be there, but you also need to have a seat at the table to achieve the value to get that seat at the table. And I think if I could take one point forward for anyone out there who has the opportunity to advocate for enterprise architecture, um, to be an ally um, to folks who are trying to do the right thing for the right reason, um, it's to open up space and invite folks in the enterprise architecture strategy group to sit at the table with you um, and then allow them define the value they're going to provide, let them set those KPIs and expectations, and then ultimately help them to help you deliver that value back. Yeah, that makes sense, JM. Um, but to come back, Carl, I, um, if people find that whole conversation interesting and they say, hey, that Carl guy, that's a smart guy. I want to have more conversations with him on this. <laughs> Where can people find you? So they can find me at carlisle.gun at trace3.com or LinkedIn. Um, I don't have Facebook, funnily enough, so don't look for me there. Um, but yeah, working as a principal consultant for the financial services group here, I actually don't do too much enterprise architecture directly anymore. Instead, just apply the architectural vision to my overall projects of ITSM and, well, kind of whatever comes up on the radar nowadays. So I, I just finished up some infrastructure strategies and then just doing general tool selection frameworks and assessments there. So it's, uh, it's still that jack of all trades. Yep. And we definitely will put your contact information, your email and your LinkedIn as links in the show notes. Ah, speaking about the show notes, Roland, first and foremost, 
Thank you to all of our wonderful listeners. We've had a great conversation with Carlisle and Roland and myself. And for all of you to join in, well, we can't say thank you enough. Uh, It's great to have a wonderful community of folks out there. And speaking of our community, uh, feel free to reach out to us by sending us an email at hello at whatsyourbaseline.com or even leaving a voice message on our our system Anchor, which will give you a chance to interact with us directly. Um, Speaking about other ways of interacting, if you haven't had a chance to leave a rating or review for our podcast on your podcatcher of choice, please do. You know those nasty algorithms. They love when audience gives feedback. They can emerge this to the top of your podcatchers. And of course, we've mentioned a couple of different graphics. You can catch that at whatsyourbaseline.com for all the companion articles or specifically for this episode at whatsyourbaseline.com slash episode 14. Well, thanks again to my wonderful host and guest. Uh, For now, I've been J.M. Erlinson. I'm Carl Algon. And I'm Roland Volt. And we will see you in the next one.